Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight saying thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for giving us another day, Lord, protecting us and providing for us, Heavenly Father. But we just ask that you uh, open up your word tonight, Lord, and let it seep into our minds and into our hearts. Uh, let us learn, Lord, according to what you would have us to know, so that we can be better servants in your kingdom. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we praise you. Lord, and we uh, don't lose scarlet those that are in the path of the storm. Heavenly Father, please bless them, protect their homes and protect them. These words we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Um, we will go ahead and get yeah. started the recording. Okay. So um, we're still in the um, month closing out, I guess, now the month of September as we look at the week of passion, which has been our theme. Looking at Passion Week, and we know that passion, um, passion Week is called that because of the uh, Greek term passion. <clears throat> passion is derived from, and we look at that as we look at to endure, to suffer, as opposed to the deep emotion that we would normally look at passion and make a reference to. We know that. Jesus, in terms of reference to passion, is he is suffering in a sense of preparing for his death, preparing for the cross, preparing to uh, cover our sins with his shed blood. So tonight's theme, we're going to focus on forecasting destruction. Forecasting destruction. That is the theme for tonight as we look at uh, themes of what has been happening. Jesus has been in the temple. He's been challenged by all these leaders, dealing with a lack of hypocrisy from the leaders of the temple. Now we're going to get into probably one of the most difficult uh, passages in Scripture, especially within the Gospels. We look at um, the discourse on Mount Olive. So, you know, those in the room right now cannot see um, my presentation yet, but hopefully we'll get there. Um, hopefully everyone online can see. And right now, I'm sharing a map of Jerusalem. We've been looking at Jesus' journey as he marched triumphantly into uh, Jerusalem. We saw the, the celebration that was had, see where he goes as he went into the temple. Those of you online are describing to you, for those who can't see, um, we have to the east of this map, the temple area as well as Jerusalem and this wall of off city is all in yellow. The temple is in the red. And it was, that's to the west. To the east, the northeast, you'll see Mount of Olives. That's going to be our location for tonight. And then we also see scenes where he did various acts throughout this week of fashion we've been looking at. We see um, the fig tree, where he cursed the fig tree, and the path that he's taken each night as he closed out uh, going to Bethany, going from Bethany on to Jerusalem. So for tonight, we're looking at the events that are occurring as we still are still on Tuesday. We're continued for the last three weeks on three days before the Passover. So for tonight's events, I want you to focus on this prediction for the temple's destruction. Um, this is going to be key for our understanding of the passage that we're going to evaluate and read tonight. When Jesus exits the temple, his disciples want him to look at the beautiful construction that has happened. King Herod had been undoing a reconstruction or remodeling uh, process for the temple. And they're like, look, teacher, see these stones. And Jesus' response is like, but in the days, no stone of this temple will be left unturned. He's forecasting the destruction of the temple. Upon that, they leave, and Jesus moves on to the Mount of Olives where he takes a seat, and we have what we call the Mount Olive Discourse. Now, this is not to be confused of, by the Sermon on the Mount. That happened 
earlier in Jesus's ministry, this is the Mount All of Discourse where he's talking explicitly about the end of days. So we're going to get into the meaning of what the end of days is and everything about his discourse. This is where we're going to uh, settle in on for our discussion tonight. And then we see in parallel as Jesus was in the temple, because remember, you know, he was given the leaders of the temple the business in terms of calling out their hypocrisy. They got fed up. So they were able to lure Judas over. And this is where we see the conversation where Judas decides to betray Jesus with the exchange of money. So these are the events that we see closing out the month of uh, September, closing out most likely the day of Tuesday as we're going three days out before the start of Passover. Now, like I said, because this tonight is one of those tough passages um, to dig into, I felt like it would be good to kind of give a brief overview for some, or maybe a review or refresher for others, Bible study tips how to have good uh, Bible study tools. So I encourage you, get a good Bible, uh, a good study Bible that has cross-references, meaning that, you know, as you read certain passages of Scripture, some passages of Scripture, like one we'll read tonight, may refer back to other passages of Scripture. Maybe a, new, a passage in the New Testament is in reference to a passage of the Old Testament, and the reference may not be immediately... You may not be immediately aware of that reference if you don't have that deep knowledge of scripture. So that's where a study Bible can help with those cross references. And yes, the study Bible is different from commentary. So commentary can provide a lot of, sometimes a study Bible actually includes commentary. Um, sometimes a commentary is basically take, walking down the paths of scripture to give kind of broader information about yeah, the things, I guess. My question is, yes. it's different from commentary or the same? It, sometimes it can be one of the same, sometimes it can be different. That's okay. how I'll ask that, that, that one, guys. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, study Bible is going to have notes in there, commentary, the smaller notes. It's not going to have as much details, um, whereas the commentary is more focused on a lot more. Okay, specifically here, what I was the commentary you recommended that's commentary, that's not a study Bible, right? right. Okay, yeah. that, was, that was what the I study was study Bible is usually going to have the Bible, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a Bible, the Bible with the okay, and okay. okay. Right. but even sometimes some commentaries have the scriptures that they're referencing to, yeah, yeah, they do. That's the why I say it. yeah. I, I, but I, yeah, I just wanted to when you said that, yeah. I just I didn't know the difference between you two, right? Yeah, uh, man, I'm trying to, but no, no, because yeah. this brings up the next point about commentaries, right? And so I would say, you know, you have a lot of different commentaries that are out there from John MacArthur to Tony Evans, R.C. Sproul, some of the more recent people. You have some of our early church fathers like John Calvin, as well as uh, St. Augustine. And so you have various different commentaries that are out there and some of our modern day scholars may be referring to some of these um, older saints of scripture. But I would encourage you as you, if you get commentaries, you know, read uh, multiple commentaries because scripture in and of itself is the inspired word. We believe that God breathed life into the scripture. He had human beings write the scripture, but they were being inspired by God. And we look at the canon of, of scripture. If we look at the commentaries, we're looking at um, a diagnosis of what we're reading in scripture. A lot of times maybe it's contextual information things about the culture, things about the audience, things about the author of the scriptures that we're reading. And then maybe certain other events that may have happened after the scripture. That's what we're going to get into tonight. So that's where a good commentary is it's helpful. But you also have Bible concordances. This is an alphabetical listing of words and phrases found in the Bible that can, again, better help your understanding of certain criteria and things that we're reading. But I will also remind you, scripture is not written in English. And so language changes over time. You have the original Greek and Hebrew that these authors were writing in. And even with English, even when we compare the King James English to like ESV or the modern day English, 
or even English that is used in the nation of England compared to the English used in the nation of America. There's differences and there's word differences in here. We're seeing even in our day and time where gender is a word that's changing in its definition. So, so that's an example of how sometimes words can have meanings that we may hold on to today, but they may not have the same meaning when the authors were writing these things, and that's where commentaries and these concordances can help to get us back to what is the original meaning of what these people were writing about. You have also dictionaries and encyclopedias that can help with some extra biblical and historical knowledge about the areas and events, like things we'll write to look at tonight. A Bible atlas, like the map I just previously showed you, in terms of being able to see, oh, where did Jesus travel? When he, we're thinking about how the fact he's traveling with his disciples on foot, not on a bike or on a car or a horse, or Paul's travels, being able to see some of these areas or even like the changes in terms of the size of Israel. And then I would encourage you, you can make your own study Bible. You can make your own commentary as you're writing notes keeping track of the information from the sermons that you listen to or the Bible studies that you receive or are a part of or the commentaries that you're reading. You know, many people mark up their Bibles and they've got their own cross-references they're adding over the years or they've added their own commentary based off what they believe and so therefore they've got kind of this core information that is, you know, that's used, that they're using. So um, these study tools I'm kind of pointing out because this lesson tonight, I had to use a lot of these study tools. And I had to read the, in the various commentaries, as I did for the previous ones, as I normally do even for my sermons, because I want a broader understanding of the perspective of the culture, the historical time period that we're talking about, to make sure that I'm not reading in my cultural perspective in a way that's not in line with what God's intent is. And so, but that don't necessarily mean that every commentary I'm reading, I agree with. It doesn't mean that every uh, comment from the study Bibles I see that I may agree with, and that's fine. Um, but I at least wanted to, to lay that out there um, as we get into this, as I'm saying, it will be a tough study, a tough word. So, isn't the faith a, isn't that what faith is? Mm -hmm. the, whole, the Holy Spirit interests you, yeah. and then your faith comes out as Holy Spirit strikes you. And the Holy Spirit will oh, therefore reveal yeah. a lot of things that may be. Uh, I guess what you were saying, Matt, is that you know you go to all these things and you're reading everybody else's opinion to get your opinion. But so I'm glad you brought that up because I meant to mention this. I like I my approach personally. I want to read the word for myself first. Let me establish my opinion about what I'm reading first. And then I'll, I'll go to the commentary. Have I gone <laughs> full, all, off path in terms of what, I've dis what I'm discerning? Am I so far off track that I'm not even in line with what, that, what I thought this passage was about? Or is there information that I missed because I didn't have the historical standpoint? Now, we'll, we'll, as we get into this tonight, I'm going I'm to keep coming back to this. We're going to keep coming back to this. So it's a good question. To, and yeah, but I, I would encourage you, the Holy Spirit is going to illuminate the word for us and reveal the things that we need to know about God to us. And he does it as we read his word, as we get into his word, as we study. And with what we have within us, that's what the Holy Spirit can use to therefore illuminate. Um, I have a struggle with that because of the verse that says the heart is deceptive above all things mm -hmm. and desperately wicked and the other one that says uh test the spirits yeah. and um so that was like to be able to find confirmation for my own opinions at some point and i think that's and i think like i said because i'm i'm in agreement with you I, I, yeah, I want, because this is, remember, we're, we're people who are growing in spiritual maturity. So even as we've come into the faith, we're still, a lot of times, we're still dragging with us our old ways and our old nature that we should, we should be dying to, that we should be you know, allowing for you know, God to kill. But there are a lot of times these things that we still struggle with. Sin 
It's still something that we're going to still struggle with, you know, until we get into the uh, glorification. So, so there's, there is a need to prepare mm -hmm. and go deeper because it's also what is God trying to reveal to me that I can share with others. And I'll paraphrase. I think it was, they said it was Pastor Lewis that said this. Uh, don't come in here on Sunday morning give me a Saturday evening sermon, right? Yeah. Something that you just came up with Saturday evening, now you want to present to everybody on Sunday. You take some time with it, and you generally <clears throat> take more time, I think, when you're trying to facilitate or instruct, because you do want to make sure you're not just coming across with what you think in your opinion. You want to give the opportunity for other insight to come in to help you gain the insight. And you do pray. Uh, and that's why a lot of people say, you know, Lord, move me aside. Yeah. Let your will come forward, right? Even in all the preparation. Yes. Oh, a question in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, so, so what you're saying is often um, times when you don't, like, can, how can I trust myself, right? I mean, because our hearts can be, can lead us astray, sinful. I think one of the one ways you do that is that yeah, one you're asking the Lord to help you to understand and maybe interpret, and then what you come up with that's one of the reasons why you look at maybe commentaries uh, secondary, is did I come up with something that's so far to the left that no one else in all of church history has ever saw this, right? <laughs> well, if that's the case, you're probably wrong, right? You you I mean so you got you got thousands of years of church history, people who are probably much smarter than us. Um, so we probably should not be coming up with something so original or new. So we can we can we can use that to help us, right? To to weigh in on that. Um, and then Terrence's question: How do you discern what is correct and incorrect when you talk about finding resources in the commentaries? One of the approaches I take is if I'm looking at a new commentary, I I want to look at what does the commentary say about clear passages that are easy to understand. And if they get that wrong, I'm not buying it. Right. So if I go to John 3.16 and they botch that up, they don't interpret that correctly, then that's probably not a good commentary. Right. So I go to clear passages that you just read it. You can discern the meaning. Um, it's not it's not going to. Yeah. Matthew 24. Where is, you know, I go to clear passages, use that as the kind of the plumb line the standard and see how how the person who's the commentator handles that. And that's usually a good rule of thumb I use to, to judge whether it's a good commentary or not. So this is why tonight I'm definitely asking to hear your feedback. To hear it because we may not all come into an agreement about this passage and a lot of times what it means, but that doesn't mean that because we're in disagreement about certain aspects of what we see, that we're in disagreement about role of God, the role of the gospel, the role of the triune God, the role of what Christ did on the cross for us. Um, and so as we get through this, we'll have more opportunity to, to talk a little bit uh, deeper about that and, and reflect on these things. But I want, if we can, to get a volunteer to read for from Mark chapter 13, verses 3 through 13. And we're dealing with the beginning of the Mount Olive Discourse. And as we get this volunteer, I just want to remind you, as I said earlier, this passage is starting off with Jesus having responded to the temple and he, in his response to the beauty of the temple, saying that there will come a day when all of these stones from the temple will be overturned. So I'm, I'm laying that out there as this is context to begin our passage as we read here starting at verse 3. Uh, chapter 13, but do I have a volunteer to read? Um, and based on what we're talking about, I read from the NIV. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming, I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. 
will be earthquakes in various places and families. These are the beginnings of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. The gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will portray brother to death. They father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. The one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Every good sermon, every good lesson in the scripture should have a called through line or a primary basis that you can see that's clear in terms of what it is, what is the primary subject. Tonight I've given you the primary subject being forecasting destruction. Here, as we look at this Mount Olive Discourse, Jesus has a primary through line. So for my first question tonight, I want to explore what that primary uh, through line is. And it's from his response. So he's responding to a question from the disciples. So what is that question that Jesus is addressing? And I, I'll give you a hint. It starts at verse 4. So what is, <laughs> what is the question? When will these things happen? Yes. When will these things happen? And I think, uh, yeah, when will these things happen, but also what will be the signs, right? So it's a two-part question. So it's Matthew, it's Luke, and it's Mark that covers this discourse. And only in Mark do we see that the disciples are actually named to be Andrew, Peter, James, and John. And in the other passages, they're only referenced as just the disciples. So we don't know if it's just these four that are present for Jesus, or if it's the other, or the 12, or his other, I don't think it's a crowd. But uh, at least we know these four at least are present by Mark's account. So this the, the, the question. We just established. That's what is going to establish how we look at. It. But there was a key word that's being uh, that we've repeated here in these questions. Verse four: What the disciples mean by these things? And I want to. I'll, I'll give you a hint with this one. I, I tried to reference how did how did we how did I try to establish how we got to here to this passage? He's in the temple, he left out the temple. The temple was something they wanted to point to, right? And he responded to that, things that are going on in the temple. So at the beginning of, of chapter 13, which we did not read, verses 1 through 2, that is where I would say is where these things probably are. So what are these things that he's referring to? He talks about the temple being the stones, basically the temple being destroyed. Right, and so it's like, well, let it be. And it's interesting because you remember the Jews, the tabernacle, eventually the temple is God's presence among them. So if the temple was destroyed, in their minds, that's the end. I mean, it, it's, it's over, right? And so that's kind of, I think in the Jewish mindset, they're probably like, when is this going to happen? Because this is the end of the world. So you can tell us that. <laughs> the temple represents, yeah, you got God's presence. If God is not present among us. Mm -hmm. What could that mean? So, yeah, so I, I draw that out because, again, knowing the question that's being asked, then also ref the reference to these things, I think, will help us context, right? Because it was really what I'm trying to drive home here. I'm trying to drive home the context behind the theme behind this discourse as we read deeper into this passage because it's a lot. <laughs> and and I, I thought about this, you know, tonight. It was like, man, if we even be able to cover all, I, I hope if we can kind of cover it, we probably won't. But I'm going to try my best because, again, it's a lot. So I really want to hear from you if, you as you have questions. I don't want to you know, allow for my speed to kind of ramp over people's understanding about the things, these things that we'll be talking about, all right? 
as we see that phrase be uh, repeated throughout the night. So, um, what are the signs then that Jesus points to for these things to happen? So it's in there after you see uh, after five verses four. Yes, that's one of them. That's one of the first false prophets. Rumors of wars. That's another sign. Earthquakes and famines. Yes. Parents and children turning against each other. Yes. This all refers to like the end of time. The end. Kind of remind me of Revelation a little bit. Yeah. And it's now the, the the what makes this passage tough though, and it goes back to what Pastor Harris just mentioned. When is the end of times? And that's that's the dividing line a lot of times between Christian community. Because like Pastor Harris said, in Jewish culture, they're thinking the end of times is that would be the destruction of the temple. Temple has been destroyed here since 2022, since the time Jesus is talking with the disciples. This this time period is about, I would say, about AD 33. Jesus is about what 33 in the 30s or so. So we know, therefore, sometime after that event, the temple was destroyed. But we're still here. So yes, go ahead. Yes, and I was going to add, and also, you know, just reading that, all those things are occurring now. And so it would be liable for anyone to say, oh, the end of, end of time is present, it's here, because all of these things are occurring. But we know that's not the case. Yeah, well, at least we, as you're saying, we're, we're seeing these signs that Jesus mm -hmm. has brought out, right? All these different signs, the false prophets, the rumors of wars, the earthquakes and the famines. We got a hurricane coming up. Um, the disciples being persecuted was one I think we may have missed. Um, but then also, before this happens too, remember, the gospel will be this, the proclaimed through all the nations. Nations, a lot of times, is really ethnos, meaning right. ethnic groups, people groups, not necessarily nation states, right. but ethnic people groups. And so therefore, the gospel will be proclaimed before the end is proclaimed. So hopefully I've helped to set up and establish at least some context about what we're going to be looking at as we explore a little bit deeper into this passage. Because yes, it is the end of times. For some, you know, it's, it's a challenge. You know, there's men, people who have read this passage and it has knocked them out of their faith. Because, you know, how could Jesus truly be who he proclaimed to be if things, these things hadn't already happened, if it's presumed that they had happened. So we'll, we'll get into that. Um, but oh, yeah. yes, Sorry. go ahead. Uh, this is just something that popped in my head, but, mm -hmm. um, and it might not be a question to answer for now, but I'm just thinking like in verse 10, he says the gospel must be preached first to the nations, but he had given kind of a, a prerequisite, I guess, so to speak, of what's to happen. And then he says, the so I figure, like, why say the gospel in the middle and then give all the... So it was that two-part question. I, I kind of look at it as, it was a two-part question, okay. both of what are the signs and when are these things to happen? Okay. So I, I see that part being more in the response to when these things to happen. He's not giving you explicitly the time, date, and whenever. So we'll get to that later or down in his discourse. But he's letting you know there's some things that have to happen prior to the actual end to come, right? And that's one of these things, you know, the gospel being proclaimed to all the I think areas. like good news first and then, okay, gospel first <laughs> and then let all this stuff happen underneath yeah. it. When we see these things happening, that's the time. All juice. More complicated than that. When we see these things happening, then that's the time. That's when it will happen. Well, well when you see these things happening, he's telling them when you see these things happening. He's saying um, these signs the are kind of the warning signals so that yeah. you know that we're getting. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like the hurricane's coming. So you see the wind blowing. and So when is the time? Well, right after the wind starts blowing in a couple of days. Isn't this the same thing here? Well, verse 8 says these are the beginning of the first week. Yeah. Don't know how long the birthing process is before it gets there, but like this is the. I mean, that's kind of interesting in your thoughts on that one, but it says these are the beginning. Yeah, because 
Who, like, like I'm saying, there's somebody online have something to say? Um, yeah, so like, like, like we're bringing up, he, as he says, this is, these are the beginning pains. And as I was saying earlier, because this passage has created such division, the question is, going back to the temple, the temple is already destroyed. Is he really talking about only the temple and its destruction, therefore that being the signal that that's when the end times were to come? Or are we talking about the end of the world? Therefore, we know the world hasn't ended yet, so therefore these things haven't come yet. And so that's, I mean, that's the question that I guess we're going to be wrestling with as we continue on reading this passage. And, and one interesting thing about prophecy in Scripture is that even you see Old Testament prophecy, there's a lot of stuff to where there, things happen immediately. You know, there's a, a immediate fulfillment and there's an ultimate fulfillment. And even in Jesus' words here, it's like every generation, these things are happening. There's always going to be a false, someone's claiming to be Jesus, almost in every generation. There's going to be wars, rules, wars. I mean, we've had that. So every generation needs to read this and be like, he can come at any moment, yeah. right? It could be, you know, be ready. I mean, that's kind of almost the application. I'm jumping to the application. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, it's like we, we just need to be ready. So, yeah, we can sit here and try to figure out when this is going to happen. But every generation sees something like this going on. It's to just remind us that he could come. This could all stop at any moment. So we just need to be ready. This goes back to spiritual maturity in our faith and the matter of like our trust in Christ. As we see these things, you know, what Jesus is going to say later on is like, don't you don't worry. Just go back to the, the Sermon on the Mount. He has a key part of that sermon. It's like, do not worry about these things that are going on. Trust in me. I mean, but we're human. <laughs> and so the worry does happen. I worry times when I know even though God has said not to. So it, I think there is a an aspect too that we need of that reassurance of, of the fact that God's still in control even in the midst of all these things that we we're talking about. And Matt, I, I often see it as a, uh, a revelation of truth. The audience, his responses might be to the disciples and the audience is us, right? And in his responses and what he's saying, there's some things that he is saying to us, and they might not see those things in their time, but that doesn't mean that he didn't tell them the truth for them. It just wasn't their time. Those were things that might be in our time. And then when he says, but there are things that must happen before then, and then he starts to talk to them in their time, right? Uh, so I think it's also, that's why you dig and you, work with the scripture you don't just read and say okay guys but he just told them there'll be war in the room of the war right but it's broader than that right there's more to it and i think there's a chance this might be more imminent than than past generations in that um for one thing i know wycliffe is wycliffe bible translators is expecting within the next remember how many years but to have all the bible at least the new testament in every every um every every, every, every language and um and previously you know there's been you know there's still a societal um bent towards being Christian, whether they were actually Christians or not, it was a, and now as we become more and more post-Christian, I feel like the hatred towards Christians is escalating. Um, he even talked about even the elect will be deceived through these false prophets, right? And so that even draws concern because, you know, when we think about the elect, aren't those to be the true believers of God, how could they fall away if that's the case? So, yeah, we, because I, I think your point is kind of drawing back to his uh, argument about the persecution that will happen. 
to, to not just the disciples in their day, but even for us as believers in ours. Because I think as what we're talking about, I think, I believe that there's a duality behind the manner of how he's communicating like as I said earlier. I believe that he's giving out what is going to be immediate fulfillment for the time of his disciples. Mm -hmm. That will be the destruction of the temple that happens in AD 70. So that's within their lifetime because if he's talking right now in the 80s, 30s, 80s, 70s when the temple falls, that's about what, that 40 year timeline. So that's within the time frame in which many of them, some could have been already, we know some of the disciples did, were died as a result of persecution, but you know, others you know, probably could have possibly lived to see the, the temple fall. And so that would be, in a, that would be within their lifetime, therefore a fulfillment of Christ's word, his prophecy, showing and proving that he was a prophet, right? But yeah, at the same time, I look at like the example of fig tree. We, now, are, are you, when we did that parable, talk about how that was almost like a living parable. He, he cursed the fig tree, you know, in the morning, and then in the evening it dried out. And it was a living representation of, you know, what can happen to as a result of sin. It's, there's a duality a lot of times, I think, with the manner of how Jesus preaches and teaches, where he's saying things that can have an immediate fulfillment of the audiences that he was speaking to but also had have future implications for us here in 2022, you know, generations prior to us since the time of the prophets and apostles. I did hear once that for every prophecy in the Bible, there is only one fulfillment of that prophecy. Is that not true? Would this be one fulfillment at a certain um, and so I guess, it's, it's I guess the implication meaning if, if, if there's only one uh, fulfillment of prophecy, if the, if, the, if the prophecy was only for the temple, then it couldn't be for the end of the world or the, or the future destruction. Um, I, you know, I think a lot of times we see in scripture, a lot of the events and things that God is doing is, are foreshadows that are pointing to things that are happening maybe within the time that they that we see things happening, but they're pointing to the broader implications of the gospel, right? The destruction of the temple in AD 70 is a, a physical representation of God's presence leaving and removing himself from Israel, which destruction of, it's the same as like when, when God kicked out um, Adam and Eve from the garden. Sep the, the separation between the relationship of God and his people, but and we, we always got to remember that's always because of sin. It's because of sin, and so I think a lot of times we see things that we read in scripture are still pointing us to that broader implication of the gospel. Yeah, I mean, I think we were talking about, like, like I said, prophecy can have the uh, an immediate fulfillment, but as, as Matt's saying, there's most of the times there's a foreshadow or a pointer. There's a greater horizon to that prophecy. So, for instance, there's a ton of prophecies for the day of the Lord in the Old Testament. The day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. And many times that was, there was immediate prophecy. Some army came in and, you know, but the, you read the descriptions, the day of the Lord, like the sky will be blackened. And it's like, wow, you know, that sounds apocalyptic, right? You know what I'm saying? But, and so that had immediate fulfillment because some enemy came in yet it points us to a greater day of the Lord in which Jesus is going to come back so I think there's ways and prophecies can have not multiple fulfillments but I guess a greater fulfillment right there's multiple horizons in which to see it so there's a fulfillment and then it points to something even greater right and that's you see a lot of that in the Old Testament and so that's what you're saying about the big tree being a parable so these are also kind of like a parable. Just like with, um, you know, it's like uh, the, the famous example, of course, is Abraham and, you know, crushing his son, Isaac, which he does not do, but a for, it's a pointing to a foreshadow of God the Father who would crush his son on the cross, right? He would fulfill that, right? And so, yeah, there's a lot of things that we see in scripture that are, will point to a greater fulfillment. I love that. 
yeah, we clearly not gonna get it. So uh, let's read because I did one of these games this past because again, this uh, this is one of these difficult uh, verses, but. If I could get somebody to read verses 14 through 22, we're looking at the abomination of desolation. And this kind of covers our, our conversation that we've been having. Is, is this about a, a fulfillment within the disciples' time, or is this about the fulfillment of something later? So do I have a volunteer? I read it. Um, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one who is on the housetop must not go down or go in to get anything out of his house. And the one who is in the field must not turn back to get his coat. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, but pray that it may not happen in the winter. Those days will be a time of tribulation, tribulation such as such as has not occurred since the beginning of the cre of the creation which God created until now and never will. Unless the Lord has shortened those days, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect whom He chose, He shortened the days. And then, if anyone says to you, "Behold, here is the Christ," or "Behold, He is there," do not believe him. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. So that's, this is where I, when I was making reference to the elect, being the led astray, this is that verse I was making reference to. Um, so what is the abomination of desolation? This is definitely a question. If you read verse 14 from the King James version of your Bible, what you would have seen is that that was there that is missing. And I'm reading the ESV. I had the ESV up. You may uh, you may miss a what I would call probably what was a scriptural note, where after it says the abomination of desolation, it makes reference to Daniel. It's the book of Daniel being a prophecy, and he has a similar prophecy about the destruction. You see, in those older versions of the scripture, this direct reference, I would call it probably, but it's probably more of a cross reference that maybe Mark didn't actually have in there. If you remember back to my Bible study tips a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the idea of missing verses, and the idea of Sometimes it could have been a, a scriptural note that got included into the, um, the verse, but I think in this case it's a good note because it lets it reminds us that the abomination of desolation was at least not the first time this appears, this term in scripture. It is would therefore, depending on how well versed his disciples were with the book of Daniel. And, or even history of uh, whether or not Jewish culture had maybe an understanding of that term. As Jesus brings that up, it's likely maybe they knew what that meant. So I'm going to go ahead and address what it is. And this is a term that goes back to our previous conversation about, is this about current fulfillment within the disciples' time, or is this about greater fulfillment? And the scholars, you know, as you read different biblical studies, studies or, or biblical commentaries or study Bibles, they're, many are divided on this issue. You know, whether or not this is about things that have happened within the disciples' lifetime, or if these are things that are pointing to come. And so um, I'm saying that the abomination of desolation likely was a reference to AD 70 when the temple was destroyed as the Roman armies that finally came in. Uh, the Roman armies had an insignia, the, the um, eagle. And the eagle was uh, kind of a reference to Caesar, the emperor of Rome. And so it would have been an abomination for the, the these Gentiles to be in the temple into the holies of holies into these areas that were precluded to just certain people but right before the destruction of the temple. There are two other events that happened. There was a pig that was slaughtered on the temple prior to AD 70. There's another event that includes rope. But 
there's at least historically proof that there was a, some level of historical signs that could point to fulfillment within the lifetimes of the disciples. I think that's really what I want to draw out from this. Um, so there was proof and evidence that there was fulfillment with the destruction of the temple and evidence of these signs. They saw all these things we talked about in these signs in their lifetime. But at the same time, we still have this fulfillment to come the destruction of the earth. So, yeah, this, again, it's a tough passage, this, these tough terms, but this is, this is proof, too, why you need the commentaries, why you need extra biblical resources, the commentary, because I would have never thought, yeah, I would have never made the connection back to Daniel. I would have never known the history of Rome outside, after the Bible has been written without some historical knowledge, right? That would have helped understand it. There was at least some fulfillment, because otherwise, when I, I, every time prior to studying this, I've always, always just, uh, just assumed it's only about <laughs> the, the future destruction, and there is no reference of these things happening in Jesus' lifetime, right? Or not Jesus' lifetime, but in the disciples' lifetime. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. Without, without the resources, I wouldn't even know what the words mean. You know, it's like, is it a person or so, you know? And so we realize that after studying it, it's some some type of act or something that desecrates the temple, right? And so like you mentioned, the pig, someone took a pig and sacrificed to some Roman uh, Zeus or something, right? That could be a fulfillment of it. Or was it Roman soldiers going into the temple, right? Or is it referred to the Antichrist coming to the temple, setting up a, some image to worship him, right? So there's all these, of course, interpretations, but it, it is some act or something that's done that desecrates, uh, defiles God's temple. Yeah, and for that future act, for the Antichrist to come back, that means the temple would have to be restored. Right, 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 right. For that act to happen, right? right. So, Isn't there a mosque right now? Yes, yes it's there's a lot of mosques at that site. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, it, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I would think there was there would be some representation. Because, like, and we talk about the temple, you know, we as believers now, and after the death of Christ, we have we are our bodies are the temple dwelling of the holy spirit right and so but does that mean that there's somehow represent that you know so it, it, i don't know i can't yeah i can't answer them that specific question but it is it's those things that you know people think about that challenge their faith like it will lead them to question the scripture and it's good to be aware of that as 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 we as Christians grow and mature, so the rest because a lot of because as I was kind of rereading it, those days those those words those days stand out. So, are those days whatever the act is, is it like a representation of the desolation? Like you know, I'm trying to yeah, the it. days in which the end end of days come, right? Yeah, like the you know you know. Uh, Woe to those who are pregnant and nursing or, you know, pray that it doesn't happen in the winter. So I feel like he's saying those days will be a time and those days will something else he says about. So I'm thinking whatever the, the desolation is, these those events that will happen. These events, praying that, you know, not in the winter. So I, yeah. I, I know what I'm trying to say, but it yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, because, because we, used, we read earlier about there would be these signs, there would be these things that would have to happen prior to the actual in the in the days or whatever the event is that will be the considered the end. So yeah, it's it's um it, I mean I got a I got a response about putting it in another section. So let me kind of jump ahead. So Flavius Josephus is a name that if you read a lot of biblical commentaries, his name comes up a lot. Because he is a Jewish historian in the time of the disciples. And he gives us a lot of times when we're talking about the fact that you know, the temple was destroyed in AD 70. It's from his writings that we get a lot of that information from. Or, and I say we, I'm talking about the, scholars, the biblical scholars, people who write their uh, biblical commentaries. A lot of times they're drawn from him or people from that era, from that time frame. And so he writes. In his, in his book, how 
he encouraged during the time in which the Roman soldiers actually destroyed the temple. This was occurring during what was called the First Roman Jewish War, um, which he encouraged the Christians to flee to the mountains, some of them to lot. So he's pointing to the idea that if we're to believe him and his historical records, because again, this is just one man's re a reference. We weren't there, but we're, we're, a lot of us, a lot of scholars are trusting on the, in, 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 in his record at being there. He writes about a lot of things that were fulfilled in terms of Emperor Nero using Christians to burn Christians as human um, candles in his garden. Or the, so, so we see levels of persecution within that time frame. We see a, uh, he talks about the idea of him himself and others having seen what looked like armies of soldiers marching in the clouds surrounding the cities. So was that you know a local fulfillment of the idea right before the temple got destroyed when we talk about Christ coming back? You know, was those the angels that they were seeing mm -hmm. leading toward the destruction, the fulfillment? Again, this is these are things that are being written from from a perspective of someone who was there, who was a military leader, who was also a friend of Titus, who would become the future emperor of Rome. But yet, his notes and a lot of his thoughts and commentary are referenced across much of the biblical commentaries that we read, whether it's from John Calvin, whether it's MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, I've read all of them and they, they point back to, I got this from R.C. Sproul's commentary. So, you know, so I would just point that out to kind of show that there is at least some evidence that there was ideas of fulfillment of what these things are, but we're talking about just the local fulfillment. I'm not saying though, I'm not explicitly saying that, therefore it must be that Jesus was only talking about the temple destruction. I still believe that there could be local fulfillment within the time of the disciples. But he still be referencing back the future events when we talk about the end of days to come, the Antichrist to come, the destruction of the world to come. Have I lost y'all? But there was a lot. This, this, this kind of you know, this can be deep and this can be heavy. It can be be hard to receive. Like I said, this is probably one of the toughest passages of scripture, but I'm definitely a believer that even when it's tough, that doesn't mean that we should steer away from it. Mm -hmm. we, even when the passages may be hard to receive, you know, God has put these in scripture for us for this purpose. And what better opportunity to at least explore these passages, at least in a biblical study where there's opportunity for questions and feedback, as opposed to me trying to preach from a pulpit where there's no opportunity for that feedback in that type of study. You know, I've, I've preached through sermons about rape and incest that we see in scripture, which are also tough passages. It is it's tough to read, it's tough to communicate, and it is even tough to know, okay, am I, am I capturing you know everything that God wants you to hear. You know, is it being received? So, yeah. I, I, but yeah, I wanted to at least bring bring out Josephus as a primary figure that we see. So we are getting close to the time. I will go back. Let's read this scripture that uh, I think we skipped over. We we left off. We leave off at 23. That's at 22. So yeah, let's let's pick up verse 24, and then go to 27. If I can get a volunteer, I'm sorry. And in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will darken and the moon will not give its light. The stars will be fallen from heaven. The powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. And when we talk about the um, idea of one of those aspects was the gospel has to be shared to all the to all the ethnic groups, right? If you think about it. 
and Jesus' disciples' time didn't go to America. We know people probably living in America at the time. They didn't go to Australia. Probably went to the extents, the extensions of the Roman world. And the Roman Empire was great, covering Asia and part of Europe and parts of Africa. And so there could be local fulfillment if you limit you know, the term all ethnic groups in the entire world to what they would probably have to have a perception of the entire Roman Empire. What we, what we know to be a little bit more expansive, you know, they had a little bit more constrained thought of like this, this the ends of the earth, right? So, uh, but at the same time, going back to that double dual fulfillment, right? you know, not trying to proclaim that all of these things were fulfilled by the explicit destruction of the temple in AD 70. But it, again, the idea of the, what Josephus talks about seeing the marching armies in the cloud, you know, and that's an idea of maybe that's where the Son of Man is sending his angels to lead toward the destruction of the temple. That's somewhat some scholars may believe and point that they see a point to R.C. Sproul being one of them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> I know it's a lot. I like this. Uh, I don't know, this might be a study Bible. Mm -hmm. It says many interpreters conclude that Jesus, talking about the end of times, was telescoping near future and far future events, as the Old Testament prophets had done. Many of these persecutions have already occurred; more are yet to come. While a certain amount of persecution happened in the destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus may also have envisioned the persecution of believers throughout history. So, yes, same thing about short-term just fulfillment while also telescoping longer-term uh, things that happen. We close out with this because I think it's good for us to close out with at least some. Oh, if I can get verse 32 through 36 to be read. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father, be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. It is encouraging to stay awake. Remember, he gave those passages and parables about the wicked servant versus the good servants that invested. We have been given spiritual gifts. God has given us tools to share the gospel. To He's given us the scripture to read. So therefore, let's stay encouraged. Let's remain in the idea of believing and trusting him despite these warnings, these rumors, these things, these signs that point to the end. We still have hope in the future fulfillment of restoration with our relationship with God the Father. And so as we're as we continue to go forward in this life, let us maintain building our spiritual maturity by praying for the Holy Spirit to understand these things a little bit better. To continue to see lives be changed and restored, to see this the spiritually dead be awakened by the power of Jesus Christ by encouraging one another because they're, we're going to get weary and weak on these these in these days as we go through we're going to still experience trials and tribulations the persecutions may come for us but we've got to continue to, to stay as god as jesus is saying here stay awake stay vigilant stay active and stay with me and keep our trust in him so let me close out by giving you the extended study Man, reference to the abomination of the desolation, the, it referencing back to Daniel 7. So we can read Daniel 7 to see and compare how his prophecy looks in comparison to the Mount Olive Discourse. I encourage you to pray for your preparedness upon Christ's return by sharing the gospel and, and going forth engaging with these different ethnic groups, these different you know, people groups who have still not been reached yet. Um, and then we can apply by extending our knowledge of the word, sharing your love with Christ with others. And even though it may have been a tough word, I know tonight, 
you know, we still got to the encouragement of knowing that we have a Father who loves us, Son who died on the cross to cover our sins, and the Holy Spirit dwelling within us to be the encourager that we need for the days ahead. All right, um, if you're new to us, you know, we continue to do this every Wednesday at 7 p.m. You know, join us in person or you come online. We post it also on our YouTube channel. Otherwise, I encourage you to come join us on 10 a.m. for a Sunday morning worship service. So we'll be having on my hope Sunday soon. Yes, this is Cynthia. Got hand raised. Oh, yes, this is Cynthia. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I was trying to clap because you did a good uh, <laughs> job. <laughs> this this I, I, was I, tough. <laughs> yeah, oh, thank you. All right, do I have a volunteer to pray in the cell? Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we come before your throne, knowing that you are the God of all creation. Father God, you are wonderful, and you can do all things but fail us. So, Father God, we thank you for this time of study. We thank you for the facilitator, and we thank you for your word. And, Father God, we realize that we won't, in this time, on this side of heaven, we won't understand everything. But we thank you for your Holy Spirit, which resides in us to give us the understanding that we will need at that moment. So we just thank you, Father God. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for always making a way out of no way. So Father God, we praise you, we honor you, and we bless you for all that you are and for all that you have done. So we pray this prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, please join us as we get into